Now then, with a view to the help of God and his blessing, let's turn to the first letter of Peter, and chapter 1. And at verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 17 And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Especially verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges, according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout of the time of your stay here in fear. Now most of you will know that this letter is written to Christians who are suffering. And we're reminded of that, I suppose, in verse 6, where Paul Peter tells them that in this salvation, that's the salvation he's just been describing, in this salvation you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And it becomes very clear throughout the letter that preservation in trial and suffering, or perseverance, if you like, in trial and suffering, is in fact the main theme of the letter and the main reason for writing it. So it's written to suffering Christians. But it's also written to sojourning Christians, or Christians on pilgrimage. Now every Christian is a sojourner, or every Christian is on a pilgrimage. And that, if you like, is one of the sub-themes that keeps appearing throughout the letter. You have it in the address in verse 1. You'll notice that the letter is addressed to the pilgrims of the dispersion. And then he mentions the various Roman provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So already they have been scattered by persecution, but they are called their pilgrims. Here in our text, in verse 17, we actually have the same thought. At the end of verse 17, we're told to conduct ourselves throughout the time of our stay here in fear. Literally, the word is pilgrimage. So throughout our pilgrimage, we're to conduct ourselves in fear. Again, one more example in chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So he's addressing this in the letter, and especially in the words of our text, as people on pilgrimage. Now this is a beautiful Christian word, and to understand it properly, we need to understand two things. First of all, the word itself is built on another one, which means not belonging where you are. So that's at the root of the word, that you don't belong where you are. Now that, of course, is true of every Christian. Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven, not on the earth, but in heaven. Some people say that the Christian has a dual citizenship, a citizenship on the earth and a citizenship on heaven. That is not true. You have one passport, you belong to one kingdom, you have one king and one Lord, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So your citizenship is in heaven. And that is why this word pilgrim is always associated in the Bible with the word stranger. You'll find the expression constantly used in the scriptures, strangers and pilgrims. 
And the word pilgrim is very closely related to this word stranger. And the idea is that you don't belong. And how true, friends, that is of ourselves. And our trials make us feel it. There's something in our trials that lift us up out of this world and bring us directly to God. That's one of the purposes God sends them. Perhaps we become comfortable in the world and we forget the world to which we really belong. We think of ourselves too much on earth and become too comfortable on earth. So God sends a trial to lift us heavenward, to remember where our citizenship is, to remember who our God is, to serve and to worship him better. So if now, at this particular time in your life, you feel you don't belong in the world, well that's a good thing, because you don't. Your citizenship is elsewhere. So that's the word that this word is built on. But this word pilgrim itself means to pass through. And the whole thing then comes together. Because you don't belong, but you are passing through. You're here for a while, and you're on a journey. That of course implies that you are going home. You are going to the place you belong. And that's a marvellous thought. The word fatherland sometimes appears in the scripture. Now that word has an unfortunate association now ever since Nazi Germany and the Third Reich, because they often spoke of the fatherland. But in itself it's a beautiful world. Word. It is the land of the Father. And it is the Father's land that you are sojourning towards. And there's a longing in your heart to be there. So it's not merely the fact that you belong there originally. And that you are simply passing through here, but you are going there. So the very sojourn that you're living here, and the journey in which you are, is conditioned by the home towards which you're going. You're preparing, in other words, for the fatherland. You are making yourself ready to meet God. You are making yourself ready in your soul and in your life for the place to which you're going. We hope, as our brother said in the prayer, that we see him as he is and we shall be lacking. We go to the land and to the place and to the house which is prepared for God's own people. So in your heart, you are a stranger, and you are passing through, and you're on a journey home. Now in our text, in verse 17, our attention is drawn to the spirit in which we should be journeying. The spirit in which we should be journeying. And I suppose it's fair to say that there's something of a surprise in what we read. After all, if I was to say to you that you're on a journey to heaven, or you were to say that to me, and that you should have a spirit on that journey, you would immediately think of something like a spirit of joy, or a spirit of longing, or a spirit of anticipation of a good thing to come, or something like that. That would be easy to understand. Then you have all these things. You have a joy and an anticipation of a good thing to come. But what the verse highlights is something very different. You should sojourn in a spirit of fear. Pass the time of your sojourn here in fear. And what deepens the surprise is that this fear is somehow connected to the fatherhood of God. Look at the text again. And in fact it helps here in verse 17 if you as it were, miss out the middle part of the verse. It's what you would call a subordinate clause. Of course, it's very important and it's there. But just to get the full thrust of what the Apostle is saying, let's read it without the subordinate clause, moving from the beginning to the end. Verse 17. And listen carefully and think about it. And if you call on the Father, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. If you call on the Father, conduct yourselves in fear. Now, I said that's a surprise. And the reason it's a surprise is because you don't normally think of fear and fatherhood going together. 
And certainly contemporary evangelical Christianity does it. When contemporary evangelical Christianity thinks of God as Father, they think, relax, chill out, as they say. Do what you want. Speak the way you please. Approach in a casual manner. Be chatty. Be conversational. Because God is Father. Sometimes they call him Dad in prayer, which I've heard. You'll notice the whole conception of fatherhood is bound up with just being yourself or being how you want to be. It's as though the impression of fatherhood is drawn from modern television comedies based in America rather than from the first century Jewish father. What does it mean for God to be your father and God to be mine? What does it mean for you to fear the one who is your father? And me to fear him too. Obviously, that whole conception tells us that there's something about fatherhood that people don't understand. And there's something about fear that people don't understand either. Let's look by the grace of God at both fatherhood and fear. So that we will conduct ourselves in our sojourn the way that God wants us to conduct ourselves. First of all then, God our Father. If you call on the Father. Now when you think of your Father, I hope you think of good things. Now that sadly may not always be the case for different reasons. There are many, many people in the country today who don't know what it is to have a father at all. And not because their fathers died before they knew them, but because their fathers never bothered with them. Their fathers perhaps perhaps ran away from the home before they even came out to the womb. Perhaps their fathers were stepfathers, and not all stepfathers are like this, of course, but stepfathers who abused them and treated them badly. But if you've been favoured or privileged, you won't think like that. And your thoughts of your father will be good thoughts. First of all, you owe your father your life. A father generates a child. We've all been generated by a father. But that, of course, is true of everybody. Whether you're a Christian or not, you've been generated by a father. And in that sense, of course, we're told that God is the father of all. Even in Hebrews chapter 12, we're reminded that God is the father of spirits. In the sense that he created absolutely everyone, man, woman and child. He is the originator or the generator of every single person. In that sense, he is the father of us all. But of course, when the Bible talks about God our Father, it doesn't mean God our Creator. Or the God who gave us birth, but the God who gave us rebirth. The God who has become our Father in relationship by adoption. In other words, by uniting us to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. By sending his Spirit forth into our hearts, uniting us to Christ, and so making us sons. It's in that sense that we are sons of God. And that, of course, brings certain privileges with it. First of all, there's this strange one, that we share his nature. Now I say it's strange because normally an adopted child does not share the nature of his father. Unless, of course, and I've seen this happen, that a father and a mother's love to an adopted child is so great that somehow the character of that father and the mother come through in the child. That's a wonderful thing and a beautiful thing to see. It's as though the power of love stamps itself on the nature. There's almost a likeness there. But you know what I mean, that ordinarily that's not the case. An adopted child has a different nature. But in the spiritual world, that's not the case. When God takes us into his family, we become partakers of the divine nature, as Peter himself puts it in his second letter in chapter 1. We become truly children of God, and we become holy as God is holy. We become his children, we share his nature. Just as you recognize a child 
on his father or his mother so you recognize a Christian because the nature of God is in them. Be ye holy, he says here, for I am holy. And then again, as well as sharing his nature, if you are truly a son of God, you are able to enter his presence with boldness, with a sure acceptance. And you can call him indeed your father. You also have the privilege of enjoying his protection. Because I remember myself, on one or two occasions in life, how important it was to have my father with me at certain times and in certain situations. And to have God as your father means that you can call upon him for his protection too. The security that he gives you. Then again you have the knowledge that his love is in your heart. And that you are bound up in his. As Isaiah puts it, our names are before him continually, engraven on the palms of his hands. And you are also able to participate in the fellowship of the rest of the family. Where the image of your father is stamped on any other man, woman or child, there is a family member. There is a brother and there is a sister. And especially, you have the fellowship of the elder brother in the family, who is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now all these things are the privileges which flow from adoption. You enjoy them all. And you say to yourself, well, what place is there for fear in that? Well, there must be plenty. Because the Bible is full of it. Go home and look up a concordance. And look up the word fear, and you'll be staggered at how often it appears. Look up the commandment to fear God, and you'll be staggered how often it appears. The commandment to love God appears once or twice. The commandment to fear Him appears scores of times. Scores of times. In a positive, positive way. As though your whole relationship to God can be summed up in this fear God. Well, in fact, is that not how the preacher Ecclesiastes puts it? Let us hear, he says, the conclusion of the whole matter at the end of his book. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For that is the sum and substance of our life. Fear God. And so often that word fear... And fear in God is used as a substitutionary expression for the whole of religion. Isaac feared God. Or David had the fear of God in his heart. It's as though it sums up what a believer is actually like. Now you may say, well that refers to the Old Testament. But it does not refer to the Old Testament. The fear of God is put just as much before as in the New Testament script. Didn't the Lord Jesus Christ tell the disciples when they were going out on the ministry not to fear man who can kill your body but fear the one who is able to cast both body and soul into hell. Notice how he puts the fear of God in that sense into the heart of those who are to be preachers of the gospel. Let not your preaching, your conduct, be governed by the fear of man, but let it be governed by the fear of God, Christ said. And again and again, those who profess the name of Christ are told to remember that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, to remember that our God remains a consuming fire. So fear definitely belongs to sonship. And fatherhood. And that takes us to what fear is in the first place then. What is it to fear something? What is it to fear God? Now there's a way in which fear is such an obvious thing that it's difficult to break it down. But everything in a way can be broken down a bit further. Take something like the holiness of God. It's good sometimes to think of it as a white light. A glorious thing. And you think a white light is a simple thing. But then it shines through a prism and lo and behold you see all the colours of the rainbow. 
And all these colours together make up the dazzling glory of white light. That's the way the holiness of God is. In itself it is a simple blaze of something, a glorious blaze of something that would make you fall before it, as we'll see in a moment. But yet you can separate it out into its various strands. There is justice, there is mercy, there is grace, there is righteousness. All the attributes of God taken together form the blaze of white light. Now fear is a bit like that. You would say it was a primitive emotion. Uh, Colours are like that too. Every child will know that there are primary colours. And then if you mix these primary colours together, you get what's called secondary colours. Now you would say that fear was a primary colour. But look at it. And look at it hard and you'll see that it separates out into various strands. So what is it to fear God? And may God bless this to us. What is it to fear Him? Well, first of all, and I'll put these things together with words beginning with A, which will help us to remember them. First of all, fear contains awe. Awe in the presence of the glorious perfection of God. That is pretty much the same as to say awe in the presence of his holiness. And holiness is almost an attribute that covers the whole of what God is. This is the blaze of light which makes God dwell in light unapproachable. He is holy. Yes, in one sense we are to be holy as he is holy. Separate and apart and different. Light shining in the world in the image and likeness of God. But what is that? It's like the moon in the face of the sun. It is God who is originally light and God who is originally holy. And there's a sense in which that holiness will always be apart and it will always be different. Shining in a luminous brightness that we will never really approximate to. And fear is always awe. Sheer awe in the presence of that holiness. And that's why there's something about the presence of God that always makes you prostrate on the ground. That's why the word for worship is essentially the word for falling down flat on your face. Prostration. Because the overwhelming sense in the presence of God is holiness. And the first response of any creature in heaven or hell is prostration before God. One of the brothers who prayed mentioned that too. That the angels in their holiness veil their faces in the presence of God. And that's why the first, the saddest sign in anybody is irreverence. And the most promising sign in anybody is reverence. Where the fear of God is, there is awe in the presence of his holiness. But let me say that that is something that extends um, even to the devils themselves. In other words, wherever there is a real consciousness of the presence of God, there will be a falling down. (coughs) Wherever there is a consciousness of being in the presence of God, there is a prostration and a falling down. But the Christian doesn't have the awe that the devil has or the fallen angels have. The Christians have something more than that. The true believer does. And if you are in Christ, you have this. You don't just have awe in the presence of his holiness. You you have an admiration of his holiness. The devils don't admire God. They are in awe, but they don't admire. But you, by grace, admire By that I mean you see his holiness as a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing. A thing on the one hand that makes you stand at a distance. A thing on the other hand that makes you come near. It's almost like Moses when he saw the bush that burned and said, I will now draw near. I will turn aside and see this great wonder. Now God of course then told him not to come too near. And it's a little like that. There is the drawing near and there is the sense of watch and stay. That is always where God is. 
But later in Exodus, we read that Moses drawn, drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And that's in the Christian. When you are born again, the holiness of God remains a fearful, awful thing. But it is something to which you are irresistibly drawn. You're drawn to it. There is something magnetic and attractive in it. In his justice, in his holiness, his righteousness, his purity, but of course his mercy and his grace too. You see these things. You see them plainly in Christ. That enables you to come and it enables you to draw near. But never will you condemn him. Never will you put him down. You will always stand on the side of God. You will never condemn his holiness. You will never speak evil of his justice. You will always justify God and in all, in all your dealings with him. Didn't David say that? In Psalm 51, when God took him and brought him to repentance, David said that you may be feared. There is forgiveness that you may be feared. How does he put it in Psalm 51? It's better to just take it as it's actually written. That you may be just in, in your dealings. Seem to be just. Declare to be just. Um, I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is before me. Against you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Notice David says, doesn't say I've been dealt with harshly. He doesn't say my child shouldn't have died. He doesn't say any of that. He says you are clear in judging still. So the believer always justifies God's holiness and always admires his holy character. So there's awe in the presence of his holiness. There is admiration in the presence of his holiness. And there is also apprehension of his judgments all the time. And this takes us really to the heart of our text. If you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, there is an apprehension of his judgments. That means that you are constantly alive to the fact that God is judging. He is certainly merciful and gracious. He by no means clears the guilty and he is not partial in his judgments. He will deal with you and with me, as he sees fit, and as is right and just. He will meet out chastisements, he will meet out judgments, as is right and fit and proper. He never has a favour for whom he says, oh, well, I just let that be in this child. He is absolutely scrupulous and careful with every single person to chastise as a father chastises, to judge as a judge justice, judges. And at all times we will be apprehensive of his judgments and sensitive to them. Recognizing his right to deal with us as a father and as a judge. Notice if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves in fear. Awe, admiration, apprehension. And the last thing in fear is actually, it doesn't seem related, but it's there. It's an allegiance to his person. The fear of God seems to be associated in the scripture with allying yourself on the Lord's side. The person who really learns to fear him in that admiring way is a person who stands out on the Lord's side. A person who says, well, you do what you wish, but I and my family will be on the Lord's side. We will fear the Lord. We will have respect to the Lord's commandments. We will stand under the Lord's banner. We ally ourselves with him. All admiration, apprehension, and allegiance. Now then, how does that relate to God, our Father? Well, let's put it like this. First of all, if you call on the Father, and that's what the text says, if you call on the Father, first of all, remember 
what your father is like. Verses 15 and 16. As he who called you is holy. Well, in fact, just go back to verse 14. As obedient children. And he describes that negatively. Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. As obedient children, as he who called you is holy, so also you be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Now, <coughs> the holiness of God isn't just something that holds you in awe, or something that you admire, but it is something that you emulate, and something that you covet. And something that you must have yourself if you are a legitimate child of God. Without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Without holiness, no man can see the Lord. And if you have not holiness, you are not a child of the Lord. And the mark of holiness is striving towards it all the time. He who has this hope in himself purifies himself even as God is pure. And this child of God is recognized by the very desire to be holy as God is holy. There's a lamentation when there's a falling short of it. Now how different that is from a contemporary attitude which says that God doesn't really care about commandments. God doesn't really care about holiness. He's not concerned with obedience. The contrary is true. He is absolutely concerned with obedience, as our brother prayed. Look, for example, if you just go forward a couple of letters to 1 John and chapter 2. We live in a day, friends, of deception. And a day of false teaching. There is no doubt about that. Chapter 2 and verse 29. The very last part of verse of chapter 2. Now, let's again read carefully and notice how the thoughts move from the one to the other. Now listen. If you know that he is righteous... You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So there's a practical holiness in the heart of every newly born child of God. Notice then, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Notice the end of verse, the end of chapter 2 spoke of being born of him. Practicing righteousness, the sign of the new birth. Behold then what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us. Now that doesn't mean that the world doesn't recognize us. What it really means is that the world doesn't acknowledge us. It doesn't want to know us. Because it did not know him. It didn't want to know him. It didn't acknowledge him. Beloved. No, we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, the full glory of the sonship has not yet been revealed. But we know this, what? That when he is revealed, we shall be like him in holiness. For we shall see him as he is. Now listen to what follows from that. And everyone who has this hope in him, purifies himself, just as he is pure. So there you have it. That is the sign of a person who is truly born again. If you call on the Father, you are calling on one whose character is holy, and if you are a child, your character must be holy him too. So you purify yourself as he is pure. And that brings before you this simple truth that your life must be characterized by repentance and faith. 
repentance and faith. Give me a holy person and I'll give you a repentant person. Show me a repentant person and I'll show you a holy person. A person who doesn't talk and think about these things has lost the place and lost the plot. Repentance and faith is the sign of a child of God. Always was and always will be. So you remember that God is holy. Your father is holy. The second thing that you remember, if God is your father, and if you call on him as your father, you remember that he is just. Now, let's look at our text again. 1 Peter 1.17 If you call on the father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Now it's amazing how often in the Bible the impartiality of God comes out. Moses told the men of God and the judges of Israel and the priests to be impartial in their dealings with the people because God was impartial. Paul tells the same thing in Colossians chapter 3. What this reminds us of is that well God will deal with us according to his standard. And when he is making children holy, he will discipline them. And he wants us to remember that that is the way he works all the time. Now, far from being unrelated to the love of God, to be actually receiving the chastisement of God and being trained by it and growing through it is a mark of being a child of God. The writer to the Hebrews says that, and again it's worth turning to this for a moment. If you turn back to Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 5. You have forgotten... The exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My sons, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son. Now, notice that word, scourging. That's, if you like, a whipping. Scourges every son, if needful, if needful whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all true children have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not true sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. They indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, all the time it's for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now this chastening in one way is something to give thanks for but it's also something to fear. And you know again it's a mark of a Christian to really be in fear of God's chastisement. And his chastisement can be severe. Remember the Corinthian believers who are falling dead literally because of the abuse of the Lord's Supper in Corinth. Now some people say, well, you see, churches can be like that, so it doesn't matter really how churches are in the sight of God. We just go with the flow and we stick with it. Well, that's not the case. Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, that we are to mark those who do not walk in accordance with the tradition, he says, which we left you. And withdraw yourselves from them, he says. Withdraw yourselves from them. In other words, you know, I've, I've had people constantly say this to me down through the years. Look, they say at the churches in the Revelation, God never says to leave them. Or he never said to the church in Corinth for people to leave them. No, that's because he gave them the apostolic correction. 
If they didn't accept the apostolic collection, they were to withdraw themselves. You see the importance of that? It's fair enough if people stray and go wrong. But when the word of God is brought before them and they insist on disobedience from it, then the apostolic directive is to withdraw yourselves from those who do not accept apostolic courage. I mean, even the Westminster Confession of Faith teaches us that churches can so degenerate as to be synagogues of Satan, where the gospel itself is withdrawn. And are we supposed to stick to that? Do we stick to it because we always stuck to it? Do we stick to that because it has a name with which we associate it? No. The same is sadly true today. I never thought in my lifetime I would hear people demanding our association to ministers who have flagrantly broken their vows. Ministers who come short, yes. Ministers have always come short. And they would always admit that they come short. But you know, they took their position and they were admitted into office on a series of vows to maintain teaching, worship, and Presbyterian government. And they rip that up and they say, trust me, I won't bring it in here. We trusted you when you said you would keep teaching government and worship. So on what basis do we trust the promise that you won't bring it in here? Because it's through that mass breaking of promise that it's been brought in everywhere. The floodgates are open. And it's been done in a church we thought it would never be done in. And our allegiance is still expected? Our allegiance is still demanded? No. If the apostolic testimony and word is put to the side, then we will put ourselves in a place where that apostolic word is maintained. In doctrine, worship and government. So yes, a chastisement comes. But did they accept the chastisement? That's the acid test. And the sign of accepting chastisement is repentance and coming back to the word of God. When that happens, certainly all the Lord's people may be together as one. So this chastisement is something to fear. And you know, a fear of sin is a true part of the fear of God. A healthy fear of sin and a fear of its consequences. I want you to notice that verse we read in Psalm 119. Listen to it. David says, My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Can you say that? Can I say that tonight? That my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. David, a child of God. Yet that is how he speaks of God. Now the last thing I want to say is this. That as well as this fear of God, you'll notice that the motive behind it is gratitude and love. Inside this fear throbs a heart of love towards God. And notice how the apostle brings this motive in. And this comes in when you read verses 18 and 19 (coughs) after verse 17. Let's do that quickly. Our time is gone. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. This is almost a way of saying, yes, you ought to fear this God and to fear his chastisement because of who he is as a faithful judge all the time without respecting persons, but also as one who has brought you into this special relationship with himself at the cost of the blood of his own son. If you call him father, think how privileged you are to worship and to serve him. How privileged you are to obey him. Because that would be absolutely impossible had he not given his own son to die on your behalf. A place in his household and the privilege of serving him is possible 
because of what he did on your behalf. That immediately animates the fear with love for God. It may be a strange spice, as the Puritan said, fear and love, but that's the strange spice in the Christian's heart. And the flame of it is lit by, lit by God. It's not replicated elsewhere in the world. Uh, remember like the spice that was used in the holy anointing oil that was used on air and it wasn't to be replicated anywhere else. The incense that was to be burned, no one <coughs> in was to copy that fragrance. It was absolutely unique. So was the fear and the love in the heart of the Christian. Serve him with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest you perish in his ire. Only the Christian understands that. Malachi 1 verse 7. If I am a father, where is my honor and where is my reverence? Let's remember that. Not the father of contemporary evangelicalism, but the Jewish father who commanded the respect and obedience of his family. So on our soldier. Let's call him our Father. Let's do that. But let's honour him with our respect. Let us pray. Our gracious and merciful God, teach us to pass the time of our soldier here in fear, having respect to your commandments, which are all holy, and how privileged we are to call you our Father, which art in heaven. How privileged to be sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty. But help us never to abuse that, or to think lightly of it, and to remember the cost of bringing us into this great and glorious family. We thank you for this group of people, and pray that it may soon be formed into a congregation. We thank you for the desire in our heart, to maintain a strong witness to the worship of your glorious name. And we pray that you would bless that witness. We pray that it would spread. And we pray that all men everywhere may yet return to the beautiful and primitive simplicity of worshipping God through the songs that he himself has given, in which our Saviour is so exalted, so prominent, and so glorious. Strengthen them, though they are small in number, may they be a cloud of the size of a man's hand that is a token of impending rain. And grant those who have deviated from this to see the error of their ways and to return to the heritage of purity of worship which we were given by our forefathers before the degeneration sets in fully and takes its full hold. Do these things, we pray in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Our last psalm is Psalm 103 and verse 13. Such pity as a father hath unto his children dear, like pity shows the Lord to such as worship him in fear. For he remembers we are dust, and he our frame well knows, frail man. His days are like the grass, as flower and field he grows. For over it the wind doth pass, and it away is gone. And of the place where once it was, it shall no more be known. But unto them that do him fear, God's mercy never ends. And to their children's children still, his righteousness extends. And what are these children like? They are such as keep his covenant, and mindful are always of his most just commandments, that they may then obey. Let's sing verses 13 to 18 to God's praise. <coughs> 